I'm going to get started. My name is Lynn Jeffrey. I am the program director of IFTF Foresight Essentials, which is the part of the Institute where we teach people how to think like futurists and how to practice strategic foresight. And we're really excited today to have two amazing speakers talking about their amazing book. Um, before we do that, I'm going to give a quick update on what's happening at IFTF with Foresight Essentials, just a few minutes, and then we're going to jump right into the conversation. So let me share my screen with you now. And um, IFTF Foresight Talks, as many of you know who attend these talks, is a web series intended to grow our foresight capacity across this incredibly diverse global community that we have. It's about making connections with each other, which you can do in the chat. It's about learning from each other, and it's really about understanding what kinds of questions are people asking so that we can um, provide more services to help answer those questions. And what we'll be doing today is a quick update on what's happening at IFTF. We'll jump into conversation with Madeline and Scott about their new book. And then we will leave a big chunk of time at the end for your questions. So as you're listening, please do uh, put questions. We're gonna ask that you put them in the Q&A function because that will allow other people to upvote them and it gives us a good sense of which questions people are finding most uh, interesting. So that's what we'll be doing today. Um, just to remind you what IFTF Foresight Essentials is, um, we have a whole series of learning experiences to help you think like a futurist, understand how to have a professional foresight practice. Uh, we have classes for individuals, our Foresight Essentials. We have a Design Futures. We have our Futures Thinking series on Coursera by Jane McGonigal. For teams, we do all kinds of customizations of these. Um, for large and small organizations, public and private sector, we have Leadership Futures with Bob Johansson. And then our community efforts, we have these Foresight Talks um, do check out IFTF's homepage, iftf.org. We have all kinds of Ask a Futurist webinars. Um, if you've taken one of our classes, we have monthly certified practitioner meetups, which are amazing conversations about what everyone is doing and how we can do it better. And we do have our Foresight Essentials newsletter, which is monthly. And if you haven't signed up for it, please go to our IFTF page and um, Aicha Garalp, our program manager, will probably put a link to that in the chat. Um, for those of you, if there are any still who are not comfortable with Zoom, um, let me just give you a few tips. Um, please do introduce yourself. Um, you can uh, make sure that you, you're welcome to chat and, and speak with everyone. When you do so, it's a good idea to choose all panelists and attendees. Um, because there is an option to just chat to the panelists, which is great. We'd love to hear what you have to say, but everyone else would probably love to hear it even more. Um, and everyone is automatically muted and you don't have videos. So that's what the, uh, what the format will be today. But we're looking forward to your questions. So as I said earlier, please put your questions in the Q&A. We'll capture them no matter where they are. We'll be uh, sort of culling the questions but if you put them in Q&A, other people can upvote them, and it gives us a good way to see uh, which questions folks are really interested in. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our guests. Um, Scott Smith is the founder and managing partner of Changist. Uh, was originally set up in the US. He's now headquartered in The Hague in the Netherlands. And he has spent the last 25 years doing forecasting and strategy and for the last 15 years or so um, has been really working in applied strategic foresight. And Scott's work focuses on critical and creative understandings of the concept of the future, um, both as kind of a cultural object, um, but also as a strategic concept. And Madeline is a futurist and science fiction writer. You may know her as the author of the Machine Dynasty novels and her novel Company Town is another great read. It's a Canada Reads finalist. Um, she lives in Toronto. She's worked with a whole bunch of different organizations as a futurist, Intel Labs, World Health Organization. She's worked with IFTF, uh, Sci Futures, Nesta, Data and Society, she works closely with Scott at Changist. Um, and she's also a member of the XPRIZE Science Fiction Advisory Council and the AI Policy Futures Group, 
at the um, Arizona State University Center for Science and the Imagination. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and move to our actual people. And uh, welcome, Scott. Uh, welcome, Madeline. Um, Hi, Hello. So, so, so nice to have you here. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off with, um, I think I'll start with Scott. And just, just tell us a little bit about um, how did you get into the futures field? And then I'm going to ask the same thing of you, Madeline. Um, how did you get to be a futurist? I got to be a futurist kind of laterally. Um, as you were kind of telling in my bio earlier, um, I spent about, um, about a decade working kind of by accident in technology forecasting. It's one of those kind of like right office, right moment uh, stories that I won't go into. Um, but I was working more in um, kind of trying to forecast um, future consumer use of this thing called the internet that was just beginning to emerge. I didn't really understand technically what I was doing at the time. And as I kind of read more about the job I was supposed to be doing, um, I discovered that there was this field called strategic foresight. Uh, there was a more structured way to do it. And over a period of a few years, I migrated out of the one role where I felt kind of a, a fish out of water trying to build you know, Excel forecasts for big telcos and cable companies and slid over into uh, foresight, um, went to work for social technologies, which was in Washington back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, and learned from uh, some of the smartest people in the field um, working there. So it was kind of a lateral move. Hmm. Okay, it's always interesting to hear the different paths. And I'm guessing that Madeline, you have a pretty different one. So how did you get <laughs> to be where you are, where you are now doing what you're doing? Uh, well, one, thanks for, uh, thank you for having us and, and thanks for asking this question because I really like telling this story. Um, <laughs> I, I had finished one master's degree, which was uh, in interdisciplinary studies focusing of, on, of all things, Japanese animation, cyborg theory, and fan culture. And I was in the car with my friend Carl Schrader, who's another science fiction writer living here in Toronto, and he and I were part of the same workshop, uh, the Cecil Street Irregulars. And I was about to graduate and he said, you know, Madeline, and I knew I was in trouble at this point. And he said, I don't think traditional academia is for you. Yeah. So what you need to do is go get this other master's degree, a master's of, of design in strategic foresight and, and innovation at OCAD University in, here in Toronto and join me in this program. And then you can do what I do, which is to be a novelist and a foresight consultant at the same time and use your, use what you've already been doing, much as Scott said, you know, you do what you have already been doing, but gain a critical language for it, which I think is actually one of the, one of the themes of the book uh, as we, as we go forward. So uh, I joined him in the program. I applied, I did the interview. I did all that and the rest is history. Mm -hmm. Well, the program itself sounds really, really fascinating, and perhaps we'll have you back on a different day to talk. Love about to, the love to. Um, there's, a, there's a whole origin story of how actually I met Madeline in yes. that program in OCAD. So that's right. Okay. It was so faded in a weird way. <laughs> Great. Talk about inflection points. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. No, I'd love to. I think it would be really interesting to learn more about that program. Um, love to, love to yay. talk about it. We're here to talk about your new book, which, uh, Scott, maybe you can hold it up, since for those of us who don't already have it, it's called How to Future, Leading and Sensemaking in an Age of Hyperchange, launched formally in North America yesterday. So um, most of, some of us, probably most of us don't have the book yet, and we're excited to learn about it before we actually read it. Um, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll throw this out to either one of you, whoever wants to go first, just tell us about the book. What are, what are we going to get when we read this book? So uh, just as a kind of quick description before kind of going into what's in it, Madeline gave us this great phrase back in the last year when we were writing it. It's a, a practical, tactical handbook to applied futuring. Um, now there's a lot that you can unpack from that <laughs> phrase, but it's basically... Um, it was meant to be uh, a text that could sort of fill what we felt was a gap or a sort of, yeah, basically a hole in the, uh, not necessarily in the literature, but um, where there was, where we needed a kind of on-ramp for people who didn't necessarily want to dive headfirst into more technical, advanced, you know, even academic um, instruction around foresight, 
but wanted to get better at um, thinking about processing and acting over the future on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we, you know, kind of took what we had from, you know, over a decade of experience and working in this field, not just the methodologies and the tools that we had learned, but also what does that mean when you actually do it? Um, you know, when you walk into a room or you, you're presented with a question or a big situation that you need to unpack and, and explore, you know, how could we um, talk more openly from the reader's point of view about how you explore the future as a, as a, as a kind of embodied act, if you will. Um, and so, you know, it, it has uh, talked about scoping explorations of the future at different scales and, and sizes. Um, it talks about going about the process of collecting signals and trends. How do you actually research and bring in uh, information that can tell you something about possible futures? Um, how do you extract meaning and insight from that, turn that into narratives that you can engage other people with, uh, and then go as far as prototyping possibility? How do you actually turn that into something that you can share, engage with, critique, um, uh, explore and understand possible futures before you get there. Madeline, you want to add anything to that? That's a, that's a sounds like a, a really, really great summary. What do you, what do you want people to, to kind of, what are you wanting people to experience or learn or kind of, um, or, 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 or get when, when they read this book? Well, I think the thing that both of us wanted people to, what we wanted readers to come away with, mm -hmm. what we wanted them to sort of like put the, be able to put the book down and walk away with was a sense of having greater agency and control over their own future. You know, I think we wanted people to realize that all the tools that they need are already right there in front of them. But what you need is a critical language to practice that art. And you can't do it without sort of figuring out a way to talk about it. And what we want people to be able to do is read, read this and realize that there's more available to them than they perhaps ever knew. And that it's not necessarily simpler than they thought, but it's a thing that you can learn. It's mm -hmm. not this impossible high arcane art. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, like at this particular moment we yes. saw last night, you know, if, if it wasn't already clear, the, the sort of hierarchical model of, of leadership kind of died on global television last night, you know, <laughs> so it's so a complicated way of saying no one's coming to save you from the future. Hmm. Um, so we really wanted to make something that, that gave people, as, they, as, as Madeline said, not just the sense of agency, but um, some handles, you know, mm -hmm. a, a set of tools that they could begin to approach where they are, um, not necessarily where we are as specialists or experts, but to, to kind of share that practical information so that they could begin to kind of crack into the futures that they want to create uh, and, and get moving now rather than waiting to become a sort of expert uh, at some point in the future. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it's very, it's, 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 it's IFTF's mission as well to basically um, raise awareness, um, raise understanding, and um, as you said, Madeline, help people understand that, there's, that, that there is a way to systematically think about the long-term future and that anyone can do it. Um, and so I've, I've, uh, I think I told both of you that this is, um, this is the book that sort of I've been wanting to see in the field, so I'm really excited about it. Um, I'd love to hear what was your personal favorite chapter or favorite part of the book and why? And they'll give us something to look forward to when we read it. Well, that's a really good question. <laughs> we, were, we were sort of debating this yesterday. I mean, when I, as, as, an, as an author, we should say, well, we love all the chapters, but <laughs> um, I guess there's sort of a, there's a nerd answer and, a, and maybe a, a non-nerd answer. I think, um, because the sort of act of horizon scanning and sensing is such such a, uh, a kind of innate process, part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, and because we've sort of done it for such a long time, actually, the chapter we're sort of describing sensing and scanning, not from a, a kind of, you know, process or bureaucratic point of view, but sort of from a, from a lived point of view, um, was it was really the first time that it sat down and kind of written that out and described to people not just what how it works but what it feels like 
and the things that you're paying attention to and how that, that kind of active sensing really works. Um, so that was, that was kind of uh, satisfying to be able to kind of write it all out, document it, and then also describe kind of the flow of it. Um, you know, kind of flipping to the other end of the book and thinking about um, assessment, like how do, you, how do you get a sense of where you are in the process and whether you've done something right? Hmm. Because we all, you know, there are no facts about the future and we won't get the payoff for it for many years. So there's a, I think there's a really important element of being able to step back from what we often think of as the end product, the forecast, the scenario, the, the prototype, whatever it's going to be, and reflect on whether the approach you took for that specific situation was appropriate, scaled right, involved the right people. So kind of the two bookends of the process chapters, I think were the ones that were most interesting for me to, to, to approach. So would it be fair to say that this is kind of a um, subjective sharing from both of you about what it feels like for you when you're doing this kind of work? Um, hmm. At least that chapter, and I and I'm also curious, Scott, what it what does it feel like for you when you're <laughs> sensing and scanning? I mean, I know we're going to all read the book, yeah, um, and we'll know and we'll find out there. But just say a little bit more about that. It sounds really interesting. Yeah, I think uh, you know this is something we we've, we've had long conversations about internally as as a kind of group because we're very different kinds of people but each bring a different kind of lens. Uh, and yet I think that curiosity, people are often asked like, how do you, you know, what does it take to be a futurist? And I think curiosity and kind of a, an insatiable okay. open-mindedness is a big part of it. And, you know, it, it, it's not until you engage with a lot of other people that you realize sometimes, well, actually I do this all the time from the moment I wake up to the moment I kind of go to sleep at night. Um, and that always noticing element, I think, is really important. It's not just a kind of commissioned act of sitting down and doing a literature review that it might have been 30 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, you know, the sort of practices of design and observation and ethnography and all of those different mm -hmm. tools that have kind of come into this arena in the past decade or so, uh, as you know yourself as, a, as an anthropologist and you know, it's this sort of ability to observe the bigger picture and look at context and different focal lengths. And we tried to kind of describe that beyond just the simple act of, of you know, looking for signal and pattern in a kind of data sense. But there's also the sort of the contextualizing and the you know, deepening of the, of the field of vision. And I think we tried to kind of talk about how that feels from different perspectives mine as one writer, but also Madeline's is you know, coming from a different experience. Right, right, great. I think that's gonna be a huge help because it is, it's hard. People often feel worry when they're first starting, especially that they're, that they, that they're not doing it right or mm -hmm. that they, you know, so mm -hmm. it's, it's, it would be a really a great help for, for folks to have a kind of an inside view of what it feels like to be in your mind <laughs> as you're doing this kind of work. Um, so Madeline, what about you? What's, what's, what's your favorite chapter or personal favorite part of the book and why? Um, let's see, that's tough. Um, I think actually what is, what is useful, you know, to, to people who, who sort of ask me questions about my job, because one of the, one of the reasons that we wrote this is that we're pretty consistently asked about our job. What does that mean? What do you do? Uh, and so for that reason, I really enjoy the chapter on scenarios because as, sci as a science fiction writer, I get asked the difference between what is it to write a science fiction story or a novel versus what it, what it is to develop a scenario or to develop a narrative prototype or a science fiction prototype. Those differences are subtle but very important. And so to finally have it sort of broken down for people who are doing the same thing or people who are interested in using it as a mechanism or as a methodology, I think that having it sort of broken down and, and explored, you know, is very useful. But but I think it also goes back to that that sense making piece or that 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 sort of exploratory piece because what that consistent nimble awareness hmm. of of signals is also part of an artist's practice mm -hmm. it's also a thing that artists do you and yeah. you you take in signals you interpret them and then you translate them for the outside world and and there's a huge you know overlap there with futures work and i like 
that brings up a really good point because one of the big issues that one of the big things we've learned or kind of recognized and seen so many examples of across the world is many, many people have a natural capability to do this. I would say mm -hmm. practically anyone. Yeah. Um, you know, it's in some way we're sort of hardwired for it as, as as humans, but we completely bury it as a capacity because of other things. You know, it gets kind of overwritten by media and uh, or the sort of the concerns about expertise and virtuosity. Well, if I can't do this at a kind of cert you know, certificate level, uh, should I even try at all? But what you find when when you just start to kind of talk to people about their their own behavior, experiences, observations they then realize that they actually have a tremendous amount of tacit knowledge and they are in fact doing this, but they didn't recognize it and name it. They didn't call it that. And once that kind of clicks for a lot of people, I think it's really important because then they feel like they've leveled up already. And all right, now I actually have some observations and ideas in my head, things that I already know. And if we can help them start putting those pieces together, you know, the ball starts rolling. And I think, that's really, really important because getting, you know, getting people to sort of take the first couple of steps of actively futuring, I think, is the critical piece. Everybody needs to be doing this right now, not just from a, you know, come join my profession point of view, but from an existential point of view. Um, so I think that's really an important element of, the, of it. So two questions and then we're going to start to turn in a, uh, in a bit toward audience questions. So um, please do. Please do get those, and I see those coming in. Um, uh, I, I love what you said, Scott. I mean, it's the book is an invitation to mm. join a practice um, and to grow a practice. Really, what, what is what? What? Um, where do you? If if we had a lot more people, I mean, I, I, you know, we could try to think ten years ahead and imagine how the world would be different if a lot of a lot more people took up this invitation but how do you think the world doesn't have to be 10 years ahead how, how do you what's your hope for how things might change um if more people um were able to kind of recognize and 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 culture and sort of nurture cultivate this practice for themselves i think you know it's a means to kind of driving or unlocking a lot more bottom-up change. I think this is part of the issue is that, that you know, you tend to have kind of specialist positions at the top of a hierarchy. Um, and many people who've worked in this field, you know, have certainly earned the, the, the levels that they've attained um, through achievement and, and excellence. But I also think that that, um, that has to kind of flow down and the ability for people not just to, uh, to, to have some agency some self-determination and to be able to frame their own ideas and desires of change at the grassroots level, rather than it only ever happening when it's a commissioned project or a formal question, um, you know, that comes in, into a, a, a room full of, you know, eminences. Mm. Um, and, you know, all the transitions that have to take place, energy, healthcare, food systems, governance, mental health, you know, education, we, mobility, we could go on and on. That can't wait to be bottlenecked, you know, into a kind of realm of expertise. It really needs to be attacked from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like this sort of ability to, I, I'm always kind of cautious to say democratize, but to, to be able to use the tools that are appropriate at the, at the kind of ground level of, of systems change, I think is really, really critical. Yeah, I, I'm, I've had this um, wish uh, ever since I've been doing this work, which has been 20 years now, that it would be so amazing if um, when you started school, maybe not in kindergarten, but maybe first grade, you got to start to be part of a 10-year forecast and that you could, by the time you had graduated from high school, you would have been through one and almost two cycles of a 10-year forecast, or mm -hmm. I guess one cycle, one and a half cycles. Um, and just how amazing, how that would change people's view of their own potential and how things were changing. And so um, I'm always, I'm always plugging that idea. Anybody wants to uh, talk about it, it, I'm happy to do it. The, the first time I had an opportunity to teach futures was actually in a context of um, rising university freshmen, basically 14 to 16 year olds 
Yeah. Um, and that's a completely different experience than trying to unwire a 50 year old. <laughs> um, you know, you're actually kind of delivering some of the most valuable critical thinking tools right at that inflection point when they're needed yeah. um, the most. And, I, and that was a real kind of revelation and understanding how that could be applied, but then you also need the kind of experience to process the knowledge as well. Yes, that's right, that's right. Um, so Madeline, what about you? From your point of view, um, where do you think this community could go? Where, where do you imagine, how do you imagine things might be different um, in some important ways if this community grows, if this capacity grows at the individual level, at the grassroots level? Well, I think that the potential for teaching it to, to younger students, you know, is now greater than ever. Yeah. You know, we're seeing this explosion of pod schools, of learning at home, you know, people right. putting together their own units of, of what they think is important to teach their children, you know, and futuring might be one of those things. You know, we're having people contemplate the idea of forest schools, the idea of outdoor school, the idea of, of sort of homesteader type schools. You know, there's no reason not to include futuring as one of those, you know, common core elements. There's no reason not to, you know, because what it is is the research skill. It's, a, it's an awareness skill. The reason I think people don't want to teach uh, younger people that is because it teaches them to listen to their own instincts mm -hmm. and to listen to their own intuition. And then, and because, you know, when people start listening to their own instincts and their own intuition and trusting themselves, right. that's when you start to see change and you see it faster. And there are a lot of people who are made uncomfortable by that. Yeah. And, you know, as an artist, I have learned to trust my instincts and my intuition, you know, and as a freelancer too, you know, you have to listen to yourself sometimes. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but, you know, that's, that's the thing that I think a lot of people don't, necessarily understand about an arts practice or, or about being a writer is that so much of it is not just, you know, being alone and, and being solitary and doing, doing your work, but also in that solitude, listening to yourself, listening to, to what sort of the signals are telling you, like gathering those things, gathering them broadly in places where you might not mm -hmm. necessarily expect them, but then having the discipline to listen to yourself, even when what that instinct is telling you is a little bit scary. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or, or kind of, you know, outside the mainstream or something like that. Uh, and I think that's where both, you know, good science fiction and good foresight come from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, well, let's, I want to turn to a slightly more um, practical bent for some of the folks in the, who are here with us. And um, I'm going to start uh, feeding some of these questions to both <laughs> of you. Um, we have some questions. Many people, most people here are, are probably practicing foresight in some capacity in their professional lives or would like to. And um, as, as we all know, it's, it's really hard. I mean, we're talking about democratizing the practice or, you know, raising awareness and capacity for this practice amongst students. But um, we also have our large organizations where we're trying to do the same thing. And there's been a lot of we've gotten a lot of traction with that um, and it's growing in this era of, of uh, age of hyper change, as you call it. So what do you, what can you help the, uh, us understand about a um, couple of things? You know, let's think about the grassroots of an organization. Say there's someone who's in a large organization and they're reading the book. Um, how can they, how can they use these skills to help drive change in their organization? And how can they use the book um, to perhaps engage other people and bring them into the practice of foresight? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that's often kind of missing, and, and we've seen this in kind of working across really wide stretches, for example, of, of civil service, um, or, you know, even within a single organization, you can have very different understandings, not just of the kind of technical methodologies or tools or concepts, you know, person A's idea of a scenario can be completely different than person B's idea of a scenario, or even their definition of what the future is. Um, so kind of getting that, the, the basic vocabulary equalized and getting people a language that they can actually share. So when they, you know, even if they, they are working on different scopes and scales of problem, uh, different durations, if they see each other in the hallway, they can have a functional conversation about those ideas. 
And that sounds like a very basic thing, but it's extraordinary how many organizations and groups that's missing in. So common language, some baselines of kind of ways of thinking about and framing some of the concepts I think is important. So just getting the, 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 the simple building blocks out there um, are, is a, is a, you know, can actually work wonders in terms of jumpstarting conversation. Um, because then people have an ability to exchange ideas about it. And, and uh, you know, that's a critical piece. I think um, making it a kind of more common functioning part of the daily culture of an organization. We talk a bit about language and kind of pre prehearsing language and prefigurative language in the book. And, you know, that sounds a bit technical, but what we're really trying to get at is things like, how do you talk about the future before it gets here? How do you get comfortable describing situations and contexts and possibilities that haven't arrived yet so they don't startle you or shock you or you don't, you don't jump away from them when they arrive? If you think about all of the things we're talking about now that we weren't even imagining six months ago, you know, R numbers, PPE, um, uh, you know, t track and trade, test and trace, like all of these things are concepts that weren't, you know, language we were using in January, and yet we're in this kind of sudden future. So being able to kind of get into the practice of exercising and practicing what it feels like to sort of think about the future and talk about it more on, or more com more frequently, I think, is a is a big start for that. Yeah, and it's, um, I also am thinking about how um, there are, just as we were talking about earlier, there are so many people inside large, large organizations who are doing work in this space, even though they don't call it that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the having that common language, or at least trying to have a conversation about the commonalities could really help people work across, you know, everyone from R&D to marketing to um, obviously design, product design, strategy. So I think that's, you know, that's the, that's the big, um, the b bridge building seems to me to be the most important thing that happening yeah. right now in, in the future space uh, across different functions inside an organization and across different disciplines as well. Um, Agreed. Uh, so we ha also have some questions about um, training and education. Um, sort of becoming a futurist uh, in a professional capacity. And um, the book, I think, will the book, if someone reads the book, will they, um, how will it help them? What else should they do if they would like to, to practice this as a professional? Um, is it, we talked about the OCAD program, is it, is it, is it better to get, should, should people get a degree like that? Um, what other kinds of, of approaches should they take? Madeline, you've been through that process. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is off the top. <laughs> yeah, this is this is tough. I mean, like how people feel, how even people feel even feel about degrees or 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 yeah. you know the legitimacy of of that or the need for a piece of paper or the need for for letters after your name. That that is a very that comes down to you know sort of what you value. Those are almost personal values questions at this point. Um, it has been very useful for me. I will say, you know, being. I, I got a I got a degree in the thing I was doing anyway, but in so doing, I got a lot more experience in doing it in real time with other people. Mm -hmm. And I think what I got out of getting a master's in 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 this field was a lot of practical experience that I wouldn't have gotten either otherwise. You know, for as much as for as much as we love our book, it's not the, it's not necessarily a substitute for experience. Mm -hmm. What it's what it is is a thing to bring with you along that experience if you want to mm -hmm. continue this. If you read the book and you somehow still decide that like, oh, this is the field for me, uh, then then it's it's a thing to sort of bring along with you. Uh, as you sort of step dip toe in those waters. Uh, yeah. I mean, one thing I think is, I, for me is really important is that, that we, you know, there's been a kind of, at least the dynamic in the sort of foresight arena over the past few decades that have been around it has been one of sort of, there's a, a you know, an, a professionalization is a big step that you step up either to get a sort of, academic training or some other kind of professionalization. And now we've got, you know, we're, we're very teaching various programs and courses um, uh, ourselves. And I think 
just to leave it to that is problematic because then it sort of leaves this huge gap or kind of right. threshold that people feel like they need to cross right. where there is there is immediate need for for um, the basic kind of capabilities of this way of thinking and working in the world you know everywhere that, that for people who won't necessarily have access or, or resources to kind of go and spend time to get a Coursera degree or you know, go through one of our workshops or whatever it might be. And I think that was the big, the big driver, I think, uh, is that it doesn't have to necessarily be going through University of Houston or, or OCAD or one of the main programs. Um, that you could read this book, come away with some basic notions and ideas, and that might be it. That mm -hmm. may be all mm -hmm. you need, that may be all you want. Now, it's not saying this is going to make you uh, you know, a PhD in foresight, those, those are two different things. But um, that could be sufficient for what many, many people need to start those conversations and start those activities and start those pursuits. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it might be someone who only needs to kind of engage in this infrequently, or, you know, we kept, talk, kept talking about the kind of case of two people in a, sitting in the basement of a community center. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, they, they don't need to sort of go through the bottleneck of a professional certification if th what they're trying to do is just frame their own ideas about what's possible and also about the, the terrain and the landscape that's in front of them and find a way to action that. And I think that was a real driver for us in, in putting this together. Yes. To, 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 you know, fill in that hole a little bit and give people some kind of on-ramp while saying, you know, says in the, in the introduction, and we say in other parts of the book, if you want to know more, there are plenty of resources. We point to resources. There is a section on the website, howtofuture.com, where we, we point to the literature and the kind of ideas and thinking and works that helped inspire us. So there are other places to go deeper. Then being able to go into a more formalized program, you might be better prepared stepping into that. Hmm. I love the two people in a community center. So those were the, that's sort of who you held in your mind as you're writing the book. Or there are probably many people who you're holding in your mind, but those were, there were, there were those two among them. Yes. Yeah, it, that, that, you know, I mean, clearly there are cases from, you know, uh, we, we've frequently worked with organizations where they'll tell us, look, you know, someone just came to two of us or three of us and said, I need a point of view by Monday on the future of X. Um, how do we even begin to, to frame that problem? Um, so could we take the book and some cards and go down to the, you know, or post it to go down to the canteen or cafeteria and just start trying to break the problem down and right. figure out how to actually express ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's where the kind of the long tail distribution comes in here of, of the many, many different types of people and organizations you're seeing every night on TV or on, you know, online who are, you know, marching for social justice or working for energy transition or gender equity or what, you know, whatever the case is, um, they need to, they need to come up with some, some ideas and some sort of forward, forward concept soon. You know, we talk about, um, uh, you know, if you don't like the future you've been given, it takes a future to fight a future. Yes. <laughs> you need something to respond with if you don't like the ones that you're being presented with. I love it. it takes a future to fight a future. That's great. Um, it's, so there's a lot of discussion in the chat, which, you know, we've sort of arrived at this moment um, in the conversation, uh, which is about kind of who gets to future, who thinks they get to future, um, <laughs> who... Um, listens to whose futures um, and what impact those have in different uh, contexts. And so there are a couple of questions around um, uh, kind of access to these tools and this way of thinking. Um, and uh, especially in the US at least where we have this um, very racialized gap in access to education um, and um, the idea that so many of the basics uh, of education, basic elements and building blocks, which people are seen to need to have to be employed, um, that we, how could we add futures to that? Um, how could we make these uh, tools more inclusive, really inclusive, um, 
and 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 extend kind of the conversation to include folks who 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 are not going to who haven't you know been considered and been part of those conversations. Well, I mean, there's a lot in that. <laughs> Um, that is many. That is many questions. I'm summarizing. I do my best to summarize for the purpose of time. So yeah. yeah well, the, I mean, to me, the, front, the the most critical kind of starting point for that people need to see themselves in this. They need to see themselves in this activity, N not only from a sort of authoring point of view, but also from a kind of you know a participation and living in that world point of view. And I think you know this has been a, this has for a number of historical reasons been. Um, you know, a, a somewhat monocultural field for quite a long time that's changed. Um, and it's changed more rapidly, more recently, thankfully, there's a lot, a lot of new and different faces, and ideas and minds and cultures and experience that are that are coming to play in this, And even in our own work. Um, we work really hard to, um, you know, have as many perspectives, many voices, just internally, uh, in, in our own thinking and work as possible. Um, and so I think that sort of ability to see yourself in the act is quite critical. And that may even include remove, you know, taking the term foresight or futures studies and futures away from it for a moment. And let's just think of this about, you know, sort of critical planning and prospection for your own life. Melon, mm -hmm. I know you have views on this. <laughs> well, I mean, I think there's a reason that that you know that it's a Nazi singing "Tomorrow Belongs to Me" in cabaret. <laughs> it's 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 that you know it's this insistence that you know the future is mine right. or what have you, and and you know it takes a future to fight a, a future, but it also takes you know a story to fight a story. Mm -hmm. You know, and and sometimes you have to put yourself in that story. Mm -hmm. And 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 we have to create room. You know, publishing is in is in constant dialogue about this. You know, in terms of how do we create more room for more stories, for more people to write about their own experience in a, in of wide you know in a wide diversity of uh, of of stories and of genres you know what did Roddenberry say the you know infinite diversity and infinite combination and and so I think that the more voices we allow into the into the conversation the better off we all are and uh, you know I think that that also we then have to make the commitment you know as practitioners to be okay with the scenarios that are generated because some of them might be very scary and some of them might have a, def a different definition of success. Mm -hmm. And some of them might, ha might be surprising. They might not be the traditional sort of four quadrants. They might not be the same, you know, the traditional three horizons. They might look very different. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you have to be okay with that. I think the, you know, including people is one thing, but if you're silencing them in the workshop mm -hmm. or, or something like that, or if you're, if you're you know, filing the edges off or sanding down some of the rough edges or the sharp points of of their scenario then that's no good either you have to allow yourself to be uncomfortable mm. and, and, you know, and language is really important here i mean even yeah you know it's 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 incredibly easy to slip into language like allow people to or capacity. yeah no that's true you know it's not capacity building it's this capacity that's already there right. uh, in, in large part and part of stripping back and stepping out of the kind of technical framing for a moment and, and getting to the sort of human, uh, you know, the sort of the way humans think about <laughs> the future and not yeah. just think about it in sort of intellectual sense, but, but in a kind of active sense. And I think Madeline's exactly right in sort of being able to, to, to break methodological frames and, and sometimes completely unwind tools so that we've, take as many barriers out of the way for people to, to explore and express future ideas quickly and act on them quickly or, or right. manifest them quickly is, is tremendously important. Yeah, I love that. And that's, I mean, that's the mission of the book, uh, right? That is to remove, try to remove barriers, to make it easier for people to explore, articulate, and then act. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, 
So uh, we have a, a question from Gary Golden that I want to um, turn to, which is, uh, I think, an interesting one, given our the polarization that we see in a lot of places right now. And he's asking about um, how we might frame or talk about futuring, uh, the practice of thinking about the long-term future. Um, how might we frame that to a different uh, audience, um, a, a more traditional or conservative audience, maybe an older audience in some ways, who are already kind of struggling and worried about the pace of change in the world and the whole idea of kind of conservatives being wanting to hold on to or, or think about the past and um, what how, how do we um, so he says is there a need to talk about what might not or should not change as as a part of the conversation yes yes <laughs> yeah. yes I mean, well go ahead my well what I was gonna what I was about to say is that you know um, Scott and I differ in a lot of ways but we agree on the important things. And one of the reasons for that is that we were both trained as historians first. We, mm -hmm. we both got history degrees first. So for both of us in our practice, we understand the, the importance of looking at what happened first, looking at the history of a field, a, an industry, a, a company, um, the, the players within, within the game, and, and understanding that things come with a context. Mm -hmm. and the and that futures arrive to you in context mm -hmm. and looking at those things and not discounting them and not assuming that that new developments happen in some sort of vacuum because they don't you know culture is always already there and so i think that you have to be sensitive and aware of that when you are framing you know when you are framing new possibilities to people and realize that what you are presenting them with comes with a context uh, that you that is that it is your responsibility as the practitioner to make yourself aware of and and so, so I think that there I think there's there's that in terms of how you present that sort of old new contract to people so much of that is context dependent as well you know are they nervous of change for a reason mm -hmm. Is there a past reason? Is there a past trauma? Is there, is, right. is there something that happened, you know, and then have that conversation? And there, you know, this is something we've experienced in working in other cultures in the world that might be seen, for example, from the West as being conservative or traditional. And, you know, if you know anything about sort of culture and society, the more you think about that and unpack it, you realize that there's actually some much more complex package. Um, and there are things that we might call tradition that are actually just kind of foundational values that may not necessarily be fixed, all kinds of things. And we've, you know, we've gone as far as adapting the tools that we use and the ways that are the, the, the kind of templates and, and uh, language we use, give people to help express that, to recognize things like not just their desires for the future, but their desires they're the things that they would like to remain anchored to uh, in mm -hmm. tradition and culture, because those two things can, can function and kind of move at differential speeds at the same time. Um, you know, the, there are things we don't recognize about our own kind of culture in the West and in the U S and Northern Europe that, um, you know, we may think as being very progressive they're actually quite rooted. You go to some place like the Middle East and the Gulf where we've worked a lot, and you actually see that those two things can operate side by side quite smoothly, as long as you're recognizing what they are and why they're there. You can have you know incredibly rapid change and yet deeply rooted cultural you know anchoring happening simultaneously. You need, you need a way to take that into account when you're discussing, analyzing, you know, unpacking, kind of exploring these features. Hmm. Um. I'm going to ask one more kind of question along more along the lines of abstract some of these more abstract things and then we'll we'll turn toward the practical for the for the last part again. We're we're, we're going back and forth and I'm sure you, you this is the book as well between talking <laughs> about the concept and then talking about the practice and yeah. the way that the concept works in in society and the impacts that it has. But um, I, I'm just interested in just the, thinking about this idea of uncertainty itself. And, um, you know, that there's, I think, you know, many of us have been privileged to have less uncertainty 
um, while others have been experiencing extreme uncertainty forever. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot that we can learn from different approaches to uncertainty. Um, and, you know, certainly at least in the United States right now, we're, we're, we're many people are experiencing a level of uncertainty that feels very unfamiliar. Um, mm -hmm. But for others, that level of uncertainty is not familiar at all, is not unfamiliar at all. Um, so I know that you talk about in the book, um, thinking about uncertainty as a resource. Uh, Peter Madden brought up this question. The, thinking about uncertainty as a resource that you can use to explore. And tell us a little bit about how you think about the idea of uncertainty and how it can be a useful resource. I mean, one, you know, it's, it's certainly it can be a privileged perspective to look at it this way, but I think it's also something that can be uh, kind of delved into a little bit more deeply. But using uncertainty as a kind of white space, I mean, some people have this kind of fear of the vacuum of uncertainty. We don't know what's there, so I'm not going to put anything there. <laughs> but if you can use that kind of white space of uncertainty as a place to start constructing alternatives, Mm -hmm. then, you know, then it becomes a sort of uh, a workspace. Um, you know, risk isn't necessarily something you want to kind of shrink to zero as much as try, you know, understanding why it's there and why it exists. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of conceptual canvases that we use in futures, futures cones and these sorts of things, there's a lot of white space and opportunity space down at the other end that hasn't actually been activated yet. <laughs> So being able to kind of use those uncertainty spaces as um, almost empty real estate to play and explore and think creatively and gives us an opportunity to, to be the ones that put something there before it emerges for us, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I said to somebody, well, possibly even last year uh, before this happened, which was kind of weird. I said something like, you know, when when the improbable has already happened, the impossible is within reach. You can sort of reach forward and, and say, you know, look, a lot of things are on the table now. But I think in terms of uncertainty as, as a resource, I think that we we under privilege or we under we under recognize, we undervalue the the people who or the skill of approaching uncertainty with a certain nimbleness mm -hmm. and and a certain agility i think if you look around you at the people who have been able to get work done been able to been able to teach their kids at home been able to to face this crisis they are probably people who have dealt with uncertainty before mm -hmm. they are probably people who have dealt with other crises before yeah. you know you will find that the people who are you know the people who with a great deal of anxiety are suddenly very pleased that there's something to really be validated in their anxiety about. Uh, I gave a, uh, a presentation earlier, uh, like last week, on cognitive distortions of the future. And, and some of those distortions have a lot to do with how we think about uncertainty. Mm -hmm. and, and instead of approaching it as this sort of nebulous emptiness, I think that realizing that, that you are experiencing uncertainty and saying, oh, okay, I'm cultivating a different skill. Mm -hmm. I am cultivating the skill of dealing with uncertainty right mm -hmm. now. This moment is teaching me something. It's teaching me the hard way. I'm learning it the hard way. But I, th I think that leaving some space for yourself as a person, as a practitioner, as a whatever, uh, to understand that will help you approach that uncertainty from a more grounded place. And, you know, we see uh, examples of this every day in the, in, the, in the world, you know, people who are, are financial traders are often basically working with creative risk in a kind of offensive fashion mm -hmm. to move it ahead of them and push it onto other parties. Um, people who see risk as kind of open opportunity space, we recognize as great innovators because they've taken that blank canvas and filled it with something definitive that other people see as a vision or as a, you know, as a forecast or a prediction, but really what they're doing is kind of, they're coloring in and drawing in things in that empty space and saying, there, there's a future now, let's explore that. Um, I think that goes back to the, to the question about how you frame this to sort of more conservative people or people who are used to thinking within a different discipline is mm -hmm. to say like, look, you know, investment exists. Actuarial sciences exist. 
a lot of these tools are the same. Right. You know, to we we sort of borrow from different disciplines, and so sometimes the way to talk about this as a discipline is to either borrow language from or create a sort of commonality between the other places that it might be used or other disciplines in which it might be used, and to say like, look, you are doing this all the time. Other other disciplines right. are doing this all the time. Many of which are are the disciplines that literally run your life. Yeah, or or artists, as you said. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, people are less, sometimes they're a little yeah, less yeah. open to that, but. Yeah. Um, so the, one of the things that we released in our 10 uh, year forecast summit that we had a few weeks ago was a new game designed by Jane McGonigal, our, our director oh, wonderful. of games research here at the Institute. And some of the folks here might be interested in that. And we'll put the link in the chat. It's called um, the first five minutes of the future. And it's basically practice. It's a way to practice thinking about the unthinkable um, and, and imagining very specifically what you would do if something happened, like you woke up and there was no internet, no TV, no radio, and no phone. And what would you actually do in those first five minutes? So I think, you know, the, the idea that there are actually practical and fun and interesting things that we can do to train ourselves to be able to think about the unthinkable um, so that we'll be ready when the unthinkable happens. I mean, we won't be, the, un the future will never be exactly what we, what we are imagining it might be. But if we've considered more possibilities, we will be more ready when it happens. It won't be the first time we thought about it. And that applies to anyone and everyone. Um, so I'm really excited about the book as an addition to that that whole um, approach, and um, I'm I'm sure that it's going to have a big impact and, and really empower a lot of people um, to get better at thinking in this way, and then as a result of that, to do do do, do things differently in the present. Um, okay. I want to just um, is there anything that we haven't touched on in the last minute that you want to make sure that we touch on? as we leave people um, going ready. I, I think we'll put some links in the chat about where, where you, we can get the book. Um, any, any final things that you wanna make sure that we, that we remember? Yeah, I think, I mean, we've, we've, we've been talking about this theme pretty much throughout, but, but this kind of key issue of, of you know, this, is, this can be a kind of um, you know, book about futures if you want it to be, but it can also be just a practical way to get people thinking differently critically and kind of thinking about time differently and thinking about the sort of uncertainty in their world differently. I've talked to friends about, you know, giving it to kind of their, their up and coming university students um, or people who aren't ever going to get into this field, but, but, you know, need to feel like they have some understanding of this thing that's the, the place that they're going to be living for the rest of their lives. Um, and so I, I feel like this, it's, it has an important role, not just as a kind of professional text, but as a, right. just as a practical text, hopefully, which is big ambition, but, you know, hopefully it, it'll, it'll play that role. Great. Um, well, I want to, uh, Madeline, any, any last things? I'm going to actually share a screen uh, right now just to make sure that people don't um, miss our next Foresight Talks, which is um, with the founder, executive director and founder of the Black Speculative Arts Movement. Oh, amazing. Uh, Madeline, you will get the last word. Um, what's, what's the last thing you'd like us to remember about the book and anything else? <laughs> uh, buy our book, wash your hands, wear a mask, register to vote, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, advocate for the future you want. Yes talk about it all the time you know you can't you can't create what you don't discuss you can't make real what you don't imagine yeah. and and you have to have the vulnerability and the bravery to to talk about it even when it seems crazy and and uh, that's what I that's what I would suggest you know and the further the further you push to the edges of the frame the better yeah. thank you um, I love it. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, others, please do uh, join us in a couple of weeks for our conversation with Dr. Ronaldo Anderson um, to learn more about the amazing futures work um, and futures that are being envisioned in the Black Speculative Arts Movement. 
and um, we will be in touch. And uh, thanks, Scott and Madeline, for the great conversation. Thank, Thank you. you.